Okay, can you all hear me okay? Yes, okay. I'm uh, okay. Yep. Looks like yeah. the floodgates are opening. Yes, they are. Sorry, I had a little glitch right there. Okay, so, um, and, um, all right, and this is recording. Hold on. Okay. All right. Let's see how many people are coming in right now. All right, we're already up to 96. It's getting, getting busy. Okay. All right, so we'll wait a couple more minutes. You see the numbers still rising. And then um, we'll get started. Okay, James says hi. All right, all right. Hello, James, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our May 6th meeting. Uh, we'll get, uh, we're gonna get going in just a moment. So, Ollie, Michael, okay, everybody's rolling in. Okay. And, okay, so let's, let's get started. Let's call the meeting to order. Um, so again, my name is Emma, Emma Gaspon-Salas. I'm, I'm the president of GANIC, and I welcome you all to our May 6th meeting. Um, we are right now, let's see, the numbers are rising. We're going to be over uh, 100 here, and um, this is in the webinar format. So all of you will only be seeing the six um, panelists. We have one more panelist coming. So we have Two guest panelists, um, Dan um, Pitzer and Raphael Espinal, who will be speaking to us. Jeremy Wilcox, our treasurer, is going to be moderating the meeting. Um, the chat, excuse me, moderating the chat. I'll be taking care of the meeting. Christina Lombardi, our member at large, will be taking care of our speaker, uh, Mr. Raphael Espinal. And Kevin Lawrence will take care of Dan Pitzer, our second speaker for this evening. Now, all of the attendees, you are, um, will not be speaking. You can be brought in as panelists as needed, and that's what we'll be doing for the participants when it's time to be giving the um, different reports. So the meeting will start um, with the presenters, and then we'll have our industry partner vote, and then we'll have an announcement regarding revisions to our bylaws, and followed by the committee reports and an update from Mike Morgenthal on the tour, your own city. And then any other business that should come up. Um, so please, a uh, couple things to keep in mind. Use the Q&A feature for your questions for the speakers, okay? And then general kinds of questions or other things, um, you can put them in the chat, which Jeremy will be uh, taking care of. Now this meeting is being recorded, and so um, you will have access to this uh, afterwards, okay, if, if you need to. All right, so I uh, just want to say it's nice knowing everybody's out there somewhere. <laughs> We're connected over the wires. Um, and it's really, um, you know, these are still sort of scary and kind of um, interesting times and so I just want to let you all know that the entire board is working really tirelessly on so many different things. We all have so many irons in the fire trying to take care of issues that are important to guides and to guiding throughout uh, New York City. So it's something really that to, just for you to keep in mind that we um, you know, we're always thinking of you guys. So if you need something, if there's something that is important that you'd like us to address, please make sure to contact us. And you can contact me directly, but just also contact the board, board at gannick.org. Um, we're an open door. We're always um, there for all of you. Um, something we'd like from you all, actually, I hope you're enjoying the Virgil, Gannick Virgil, and Christina is our editor in chief, and she's doing a really fabulous job with it. Um, and we'd love for you to contribute. Uh, we're looking for great stories, um, maybe photographs, um, fun recipes, 
Um, my little kitchen hack I hope was useful. If you guys have one, you know, we'd always appreciate that. So um, feel free to contact the board. You can also um, email um, Christina and um, just let us know, you know, if there's something you want the Virgil to talk about, you know, we're happy to do the research and we're happy to get that put in for you. Now, one of the big things, I know a big issue for a lot of people, of course, is unemployment and issues with um, unemployment, with um, the um, pandemic unemployment assistance and with unemployment issues with the state of New York or even with your federal unemployment. All we can do is give you the information we have. None of us are experts in unemployment law, in um, any of the, the new um, acts that are coming through. That's, that's not, um, you know, we're learning, uh, but we're learning as we go just as much as you are. So what we can do is, and we're always very happy to do, is to point you in the right direction and try to help you find the answers to your questions. And then what we also want to do is though, we want to make sure tour guides, freelancers, um, self-employed um, New Yorkers, and not just New Yorkers, are, are on our, um, you know, on politicians' minds and that they keep us in mind when they're doing, when they're writing these acts, when they're um, trying to take care of you know, so many different things that also tour guides and freelancers are kept, um, are, you know, kept as part of the equation. Okay, so that's something that we're also working on with our government relations committee, um, industry relations, um, talking to NYC and company, our contacts at U.S. Travel. And so really all of us have a lot of irons in the fire. And so we may not have the exact answer you want. We may not be able to help you get exactly what you need, but we really, um, you know, are all doing our best and we are you know trying to get you know get you the resources that that can um, that can make a difference okay and that can really that can help you out okay and um with that that's that's really i think the most important thing right now is is for a lot of people is unemployment but we're also thinking about the future and um you may have seen some of the um, recent postings from um, nyc and company as well as from u.s travel uh, about post-COVID travel and the impact and the implications of people traveling, moving about the country, moving about the world. How will they be able to do that? When will we be able to do that? Um, these are all things that are big, big topics for discussion. And I can uh, assure you that it's not just GANIC that's thinking about this, but really all around the world, from the National Federation to the World Federation, we're all um, considering that too. Oh, here's Raphael as well. Let's just get him here too, our, our other speaker for tonight. Let's see, let me just, let me just unmute him. Hold on a second. Okay. Hey, Raphael. Hey, how are you, Emma? I, I'm well, I'm well. Thank you for coming. Um, we were just getting started doing a little um, presidential address right here. And um, I was just wrapping up a, a little bit and we we're talk, uh, talking to our guides about uh, these really great issues. And actually this is really perfect to dovetail into your presentation. Um, Kevin um, Lawrence will be um, in charge of moderate, um, no, sorry, Christina. Christina Lombardi will be in charge of moderating that. And I'm looking at Kevin, thinking Christina. And um, we're to, I was just addressing the fact that um, unemployment is a huge, huge issue and, and what we can do about that. So with that, why don't I pass you over to um, Christina, and let me just see there, she's unmuted. Okay, so Christina, uh, why didn't you go ahead, give us a little background on Raphael, and we'll get started. So thank you. Hi, Raphael. Uh, so, so everyone is aware of who you are. Uh, Raphael is a former New York City Council member. He was the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee, where he oversaw business licensing and consumer issues in New York City. Mm -hmm. He also worked on issues affecting independent workers, which led him to become president of the Freelancers Union. And as president, he is now focused on COVID-19 relief issues. So welcome, Raphael. Thank you for making time to speak to us tonight. Thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure of mine. Can you tell us first a little bit about the Freelancers Union? Can you give us a little background? Yeah, so the Freelancers Union was created back in 1995. Um, freelancers, as we know, are not able to organize or they don't have the right for collective bargaining. 
so the union was created as, as a reaction to that. Uh, the, the, the founder was actually Sarah Horowitz. She was an attorney, a freelance attorney, and she created a nonprofit, a nonprofit that was dedicated uh, to providing resources to freelancers, whether or independent workers, whether it be through, uh, through health insurance or through advocacy on city, state, and federal issues. Um, most they're they're mostly known for the for the health insurance packages that were able to offer uh, before the Affordable Care Act. Uh, you might have seen their their ads in the subways uh, in the early two thousands a lot. Yeah. Uh, but but since the Affordable Care Act passed, that really changed the way they were able to continue doing uh, doing uh, health insurance business. So they started focusing more on the advocacy component, uh, looking at ways where they can engage with the city council, uh, with Albany and the federal government to pass laws and stronger laws for independent workers across the board. Uh, one of the major key key laws that they passed was the Freelance Isn't Free Act. Uh, that passed about three years ago, and it, it was a law uh, in which the city now can intervene if a worker is not getting paid for work that they've completed. Um, before, they didn't have that protection. You would have to go to small claims court, but now the Department of Consumer Affairs would intervene and help you collect your funds uh, if you're not being paid by a client. Uh, now coming in as the president, I think one of the reasons they wanted to really bring me on is because they wanted to expand on that work. Uh, they have been very New York focused. Uh, besides passing the Free Access to Free Act in New York, they also created a a, a co-working hub. Uh, so for those for those independent workers that rely on coffee shops or on WeWorks uh, to be able to do their work, they can come to now to our offices, our hub, and use free co-working space as long as you're a member. And it's it's free to become a member. Uh, here in New York, we have about uh, over 180,000 members, but across the country, we have over half a million. Um, and I think that the best way to put it is that we're here to be uh, a sounding board, but also to be someone who elevates uh, the voices of independent workers who we know have historically been left out of the you know political process for such a long time. So since you have contacts with, with the Department of Labor and since you kind of have your finger on the pulse of the city council, do you have any advice for our membership in terms of navigating unemployment for 1099s? Because I, I think the unemployment issue is the one that's first and foremost on everybody's mind. And uh, speaking personally, it's been, yeah. it's been a challenge. Yeah, I mean, so after the pandemic hit, uh, the biggest concern was how we were going to get relief to independent workers who traditionally never qualified for unemployment insurance. So we worked closely with Chuck Schumer's office to ensure that the bill that passed, the relief package, finally expanded unemployment insurance. Okay. But now, uh, you know, two months in, uh, we've done a survey and 85% of, of independent workers have reported not to receive any money at all uh, at this point. So if you haven't qualified, you're not alone. Uh, the biggest issue I'm hearing is the Department of Labor, uh, one, had to upgrade their systems uh, to allow for applications from independent workers to be accepted. But now they've received millions of applications because it's not only independent workers, there's workers across the entire state that are trying to apply that they have such a huge backlog they can't get to. Yeah. The, com the commissioner of the Department of Labor recently, uh, recently over the weekend announced that uh, she wants every, all workers to know that they, if you applied, they have your application and they will be able to get to it once they're able to get to it, given the high demand. Uh, but of course, if you, if you apply to a certain date, you're, you're, you will receive funding, you receive your funds for the day, for the date you lost, originally lost your job, all, all of your payments will be backdated. But I know there's other, other confusions happening. Uh, those workers who file both at 1099 and with a W-2, are receiving uh, a, a less of an award than someone who strictly filed with a 1099 or strictly with W-2. Um, and that's another issue that I think Congress has to fix in the original bill uh, to ensure everyone gets the same amount of funding uh, moving forward. Uh, but the, the, the biggest problem I'm hearing is that they're, they don't have enough manpower in the Department of Labor. And, and uh, I think it's up to us to push the governor to redirect the resources so that we can get uh, as many workers uh, the the insurance that they need. Are you anticipating that there are going to be changes in freelancer tax and unemployment laws when all of this ends? I've I've heard uh, it floated by a couple of different members at this point that they're they're curious to know how the tax laws may change or whether or not there's any possibility 
of making some of the changes uh, that have been made in response to the crisis permanent, for example, the ability to, to apply for unemployment in the first place? I, I think that now we have a window, you know, given this crisis uh, and given the fact that there has been some changes in or temporary changes in, in the languages and laws, uh, that language now currently exists and could potentially be expanded to be uh, a, a, per, a permanent a permanent benefit moving forward, uh, whether it be the unemployment insurance or uh, I know they also made changes to the tax laws where you can claim uh, sick days and personal time uh, through through your taxes as well. So we're also keeping an eye on that. And I think that's a that's a bigger fight that we will have to take on. And, and, and the association will also, I think, would have, play a major role in making that happen. But it's going to take a lot of pressure and a lot of convincing of our congressional members. Uh, so I hope that we can continue working together uh, to push for those changes that we want to see to stay permanent. I'm sure a lot of GANIC members would like to be of assistance to you in putting pressure on uh, elected officials. How best can they do so? What's what's something that they can do today when this meeting ends that will help make these changes permanent? Um, well, the, the right from what I've learned, congressional members right now, your members of Congress, your reps, are currently having conversations of what the next round of relief is going to look like. Um, and there's, everything's on the table uh, from providing $2,000 a month uh, relief checks, similar to the $1,600 that was given to everyone. Now make it $2,000 and make it available every single month until the pandemic is over. That's to ensure that those who haven't received any sort of relief will get something mm -hmm. and they won't fall through the cracks. Uh, two, uh, there's a conversation around rent and rent relief. Uh, a lot of folks I know cannot pay their rent uh, because one, they have not gotten unemployment, for example. Uh, so that's another big bill, but also uh, being that they're having those conversations, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity uh, to push for those fixes that we're looking for. Uh, so uh, reach out to your Congress member uh, and let them know. You send them an email, give them a call, and let them know what are the what are the fixes they can make happen. Uh, we as a union are going to spend the next day to kind of cultivate what the points, what the major points should be. Um, we're going to send a letter, but maybe we can, you know, have the association be a, a co-signer to that letter. Uh, that way we can show we're working in, together to, to push for these changes. Yeah, we'd be happy to. The Government yeah. Relations Committee at GANIC is actually working to um, to support a proposal by the City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, that had a rent relief aspect to it um, and benefits for freelancers. So um, we could work together on that. Definitely, project, absolutely. I would love that. Yeah, I love um, that too. So you mentioned that it's free to join the union, the freelancers union. If, if a tour guide like myself wants to join the freelancers union, what do I need to do? Uh, you can just go on our website, freelancersunion.org, and they, they'll likely be a prompt that pops up on your screen asking you to join the union, uh, or you can look for the join button. And it literally, it's not intrusive at all. Just ask for your name, your email, and your zip code. Uh, that way we know who you are and, and what part of the city you live in. And you'll be automatically signed up into our email lists. They'll through the email list, what I've been doing is communicating all the actions we're taking and all the actions uh, we, where our members can take personally uh, to help push our agenda. Uh, and uh, you know, all of the benefits that the union currently has are, are made, available, made available to you. What does the future of freelance look like to you? The future of freelance, I think that we need to have uh, more portable benefits moving forward. People should have the flexibility to wanna be their, their own employer uh, without having to depend on traditional employ and you know corporations and companies to provide the benefits that you need, whether it be through health insurance, unemployment insurance, you know, paid sick time, uh, that should all be made available to every individual, no matter how they choose to work. Uh, so it's a matter of giving, creating more independence with the protections you need to be able to do that and survive in your own city. Yeah, that sounds great to me. Yeah, Let me see great. if we have any questions uh, from the membership. Just see if I can pull up the Q and A. So to, to follow up with what we were asking about um, with the Department of Labor and, and filing for unemployment, uh, our member Jonathan Turr wanted to know, you mentioned that there is a backlog. Do you have any sense of how large that backlog is? Do you have any idea of like what, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but no. what, what do you think we should be looking at in terms of wait time to hear back from the Department of Labor? Um, I, I, it, it's going to, it's, it's taking weeks and, and that's the reality. And from what I hear, it's, it's over half a million people 
uh, or backlog. Um, the one trick that I've been hearing from members about how they've, have they been able to skip the line or get a call back as soon as possible is by tweeting at the Department of Labor. Like if you mm -hmm. tweet publicly that mm -hmm. you have, have, you're still waiting. And some members have gotten callbacks within the next day. Uh, so it's a matter of just making a little bit of noise. And I think that's what, that's what it's going to take for all of us to make noise to for the DOT to act together and, pr and put the amount of resources needed to get through all these applications in a timely manner. Can someone who lives outside of New York City also join the union? Yes, we're, we're, uh, we're a national organization. Um, in New York State, we have over 180,000 members and across the country, we have uh, 500,000 members. So uh, we're open to everyone. And what are the dues like? There are no dues at all. It's, okay, it's, complete, great. it's completely free to join. Uh, we do still offer health insurance and liability insurance um, um, and uh, other insurances that are like life insurance that, that, uh, that, are, that are available and that are out there in the market. But if you, if you decide to, to get that insurance through the union, um, a portion of, of that transaction does help run, you know, the union get the resources it needs to, to open it, keep its doors open, lights on. I think you're you're going to have a few more members before the night is over. I suspect. Oh, nice! <laughs> I think, That's great I think there are hear. a few people that are putting in your uh, your address, your web address, as I speak. That's yeah. great to hear, and I, I I truly and then the importance of 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 being a member is that you know as long as we're able to grow the numbers, uh, that puts pressure on elected officials when they see that there's organizations teaming up, working together, creating a unified voice. That creates the real pressure to, to get things done. So it, it's great that we all continue working together. Um, so someone was asking, you mentioned that you have a, a workspace for members of the union. Do you, have, do you have one in each borough? Is it centrally located in Manhattan? How does it work? So we, so we have one, which is in, in Dumbo, Brooklyn. It's right, right under the, the Brooklyn Bridge and the Manhattan Bridge. Um, and it's, it's, it's been there for about two years now. So it's fairly new. It's a fairly new concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, our goal is to expand it into each borough, uh, so we hope to have one, you know, across the have one in each, in, in each borough across the city. Okay, great. So we're um, going to just take one or two more questions. So, uh, someone's asking what the web address is. We're going to put that up in the chat again for you, so that you have the uh, the web address. And then, is there also a, a mailing list? I assume on that web address that people yeah. Can once up once you become a member, you'll you'll be automatically put onto our, onto our uh, mailing list. Fabulous. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I also encourage you follow us on Twitter and Instagram. That that way, you get more up to date information as it happens, and kind of follow what we're working on. On a real time so I, basis. I suspect you'll be hearing from government relations shortly. Uh, and we'll find ways to to put our heads together and work together yeah. on this issue, so that members both of your union and of GANIC um, can, can work together to help make, make the noise that you're Ab talking Ab about. Absolutely. It's the only way we'll be successful. I, as a former elected official, I know it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again, Raphael. It really yes. it was lovely speaking to you tonight. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Our yeah. pleasure. Thank you. So, right, yeah, so thank, thank you very much. It was, it, was really, it was really great and really informative. Thank you, Emma. We'll stay in touch. Yes, definitely, definitely. We look forward. You might, we might be bringing you back. Um, so okay, great. Get ready for the next Gannick invitation, which will be winging your way. I'll be, okay. I'll be home. I'll be home. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christina. That was really uh, very well done. Um, I, I hope we answered. Um, everybody's questions. Now, I see some people occasionally are raising their hands. Put your questions in the Q&A or in the chat. We're not going to be calling on people to speak out loud during the meeting. So just to let you know, all right, because I see some hands um, going up. So I just want people um, to, to know that. Okay, so um, let's see now. So we should have, um, okay, so we should have Dan um, ready now. Okay, along with um, Kevin. Okay, so take it away, gentlemen. All right, well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dan Pitzer, so much for taking time out to address our membership. Uh, and thank you, Juan, our, our mutual friend and a colleague out there for introducing me and you. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Dan Pitzer, he is the founder and he is a licensed social worker for Breaking the Chain 
uh, counseling. Uh, and previously, he also worked for Merrill Lynch as the vice president of the employees uh, assistance program. Maybe I didn't get those titles exactly right down, but you can- Close enough. <laughs> okay, close enough. Um, and uh, so I'm just gonna jump right in. And you know, this is a big issue <coughs> thinking about checking in on the mental health of our, of our fellow members and ourselves. Um, I think that, you know, this is so overwhelming. I keep coming back to the, to the idea of a tsunami, that we've been hit by a tsunami and we're all sort of still off of our feet. And we're only stumbling up and everything. But it seems that most commonly people say, you know, well, New York, they've been through 9-11, they've been through the 2008 financial crisis. You were working for Merrill Lynch during that, those crises. And so uh, you did go through these type of historical precedents in some ways. But for me, I have to say, I, this feels different. I think a lot of our membership, they, can, they have their war stories for both 9-11 and for uh, the 2008 financial crisis. And I'm just curious, based on your experience as a social worker, do you see similarities in what we went through collectively during 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis? Uh, do you see something different? And what can be gained by thinking back on our experience? Is it that we're just too, too close to what's going on with this COVID-19? You know, I, maybe I'm aging and I feel like I have to remake myself yet again, you know, and that's a little bit scary. Can you just start to, right. to address this through those perspectives? Sure. I, I mean, I, I, you hit on a lot of good points. I think that uh, there are a lot of similarities and there are a lot of differences. I mean, the similarities uh, are the thing to remember as we got through those things. Uh, we came out on the other side. You bring up a good point. You know, a lot of us reinvented ourselves. Um, whether it's 9-11 or the financial crisis, a, a lot of things changed. The world changed. Um, after those two different things. Uh, New York changed quite a bit. And um, the difference is this is worldwide. And, and this is not just New York. This is not just the United States. This is worldwide. And, and what we are all in it together, even though we're all isolated at home. Um, I've, I've never been anything through anything quite like this as far as the social isolation. Uh, isolation, as far as Times Square being completely deserted during the day. I mean, you know, these are like um, uh, post-apocalyptic movie scenes that you see. Like you never thought you'd see something like that. And yet we're seeing it. Um, you bring up a good point about a tsunami coming and we're all just still kind of trying to get our heads above water because we're in the middle of it and we're responding to this in the middle of the crisis. So we're in that zone. Um, at some point, the water is going to recede a bit, and we're going to be then left with uh, whatever we have left. Um, and that's, it, that's when it's it, it often for mental health professionals, that's when our job really starts. Um, right now, it's the first responders, it's the, 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 uh, the nurses, the doctors, the medics the, that are all on the front line. When things start to slow down, that's when you start to sit with your feelings a bit and you realize, wow, my life has changed so much. Now what? Now what, now what do I do? Yeah. Yeah. And there's this uh, mix of experience and uh, this mess of emotions. I think that we're all dealing with some of our members. They have, they have loved ones who work as first responders right. and they're worried about them. Some people are grieving uh, friends and family acquaintances who they've lost lives for. Uh, you just heard about the, the, overwhelming financial anxiety that we all share as tour guides, but you know, this is not exclusive to, to the tourism industry. There's moments when I just feel rage at the, re, you know, the, right. the sort of political response to all of this. Given this mix of all of these emotions as a healthcare professional, are there some practical first steps that when you're thinking about dealing with the anxieties and the mix of emotions that you if somebody were to come to you and to enter mm -hmm. into your house, like, what are some of the first things that you, you say, these are practical things that you need to do mm -hmm. to sort of get a handle of this? Uh, the first thing I say is you are in control of how much information comes in. So none of us are obligated to watch the news 24 hours a day. None of us are obligated to react to every alert that comes on our phone that says breaking news. 
um, the 24 hour news cycle. It's, it's every 15 minutes, there's something else. Uh, there's more information. It's mostly speculation because they want, they're going 24 hours a day. Um, used to be, you know, news came on at night, you watch the news, you read the newspaper, that was it. Now it's constantly going. And then there's the political spin on both sides. Uh, a lot of folks, I don't want to use the word addicted, but kind of really get hyper-focused on the information. And that often can create a, a load of anxiety. Every little, every little piece of minutia hanging on that. And we don't have to do that. In fact, it's important to limit that time and say, I'm going to, I'm going to read an update every day. I'm going to listen to, let's say, Governor Cuomo's update, and that's going to be it. Or and, and really budget that time out and limit that information coming in, because that can just really, really have the anxiety go through the roof, especially because so much of it is speculation, as opposed to this is what we know. Because as humans, we don't like not knowing what's going to happen. And we want to know what's going to happen. And we tend to listen to people who, who present themselves as if they know what's going to happen. And they may not. And we hang on that. And, and it allows their anxiety often to get out of control. Yeah. I mean, that's really valuable advice. And yet, at the same time, I feel like there's a conundrum, you know, we are you know, very often, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not a healthcare professional, obviously, but I feel like what I hear is for people who are prone to depression or for maybe substance abuse and everything, one of the first things that you're told is don't isolate, right? But we're being right. told you must yeah. isolate. And one of the first places that you, you naturally want to go is to these social media, you know, but what you're saying right. is that you can become oversaturated and can actually right. be misery loves company type of thing where it's feeding Feeding all of those issues. So, for people who are dealing with loneliness and who, you know, how can they, how can they create, you know, because a lot of our members, like a lot of New Yorkers, we live alone, and this is yes. a, a natural condition, especially for tour mm -hmm. guides who who thrive on being able to interact every single day with people. How do you suggest that people in this period of isolation, how do they stay connected with the community? Well, I think we're doing it right now. I'm seeing 144 participants in this meeting, which is fantastic to see. Uh, even though we're physically isolated, we have this technology that we're able to stay connected with each other and make, you know, make it a point to reach out to friends, to reach out to family on a daily basis, be connected with colleagues, to be connected on a daily basis, to actually really uh, make sure to do that. Um, talk to people you haven't spoken to. I, I, I've spit, you know, I, I've spoken to my mother probably a lot more than I really want to. Uh, she's in Brooklyn living alone. Uh, but every day it's making sure I'm going to check in. I'm going to check in with her and make and see how she's doing and, and start to put some effort into those relationships that we might not had might not, might not have had before. And uh, technology like Zoom and just the telephone can help us to do that, even if we can't physically be together. Great, thank you. Um, and so uh, one other just very practical question I have for you as a local Greater New York uh, social worker, you know, you just heard that a lot of us are dealing with a financial crisis as much as an emotional crisis that we're doing. Are there resources out there that are available for our membership in the greater New York City area that we should be aware of that, you know, maybe do this on a pro bono basis, maybe do this as, you know, who, where can people reach out to if they really need help? Mm -hmm. The Mental Health Association of New York has, uh, has a helpline, uh, which I probably should have uh, brought with me, but uh, it's, it's easily, it's, it's, I believe it's connected to the 311 system. Okay. Uh, they sure they have a for everyone. yeah they have a a, a a 24 hour helpline that has volunteers uh, mental health professionals that man that 24 hours a day because uh, sometimes you just really feel that you don't know who else to talk to and you you spend too much time alone and you really need to you really need to process some of those feelings that are going on because maybe friends family people that are too close to you it's too difficult for them to listen to. And they are too close to you, and to have somebody that is um, that is separate from you 
to be able to do that, that has a little bit of objectivity often is, uh, is a great help. Okay, great. So uh, we do have a question in here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, more recently, I feel anxiety at the loss of human connection. Zoom, FaceTime, et cetera, are all great, but what are some things we can do to mitigate the loss of human to human connection? Right, well, you know, it, it, that's difficult to answer given that we really can't get together just quite yet. Um, I think we just have to use the, the tools that we have, the resources that we have right now um, until, we can, until we can get back together again. I'm not sure really what else to do. Um, we're all learning about this as we go along. Um, you know, I, I, before we came on, I had said, you know, in a few years, we'll be writing the book on how to do Zoom meetings and how to do all this stuff efficiently and so forth, because we're learning it as, as we go along. Yeah. Um, oh, thank, I see the numbers are up. That's great. Yes. Uh, so in, for our members, if you're following the chat, we have the numbers there. And then also uh, in the next edition of the Virgil, our newsletter that we've been putting out, I will make sure that the Mental Health Association of New York City, the helpline is going to be included in that in a list of resources that go through there. Um, any other, you know, one of the suggestions that a lot of my, but it's, it's become so saturated, people are in need of this, uh, but one of the most immediate things, I'm a dog lover, and so people were going to, you know, to adopt and foster dogs and, and cats and pets mm -hmm. and everything to create a different type of connection and everything, but yeah. uh, you were mentioning that earlier when we were just chatting with one another, uh, that you've been working with the Veterans Administration and doing yeah. sort of music and everything. Are, yes. are there other sort of more, not, um, I guess, crisis type of dealing with mental health, but just general mm -hmm. ways in which people can, can uh, that you suggest that you've seen as a successful way to deal with anxieties? Yes. Um, uh, we, when we were talking before I mentioned, I, I, I work for, for the VA and in East Orange, New Jersey, and I do a group there that's not a therapeutic group. It's just to get together and let the guys learn how to play guitar. Uh, no one's going to be a rock star, but uh, everyone sits around and plays and enjoys themselves. And by popular demand, we kept the group going on Zoom um, once we weren't able to meet in person. Um, and I think uh, shared interests, uh, taking up a hobby, um, learning a language, uh, getting, getting involved, hey, I want to learn an instrument. Let's, I'll just use the instruments for example. Uh, all over online, on YouTube, on, there's different professional musicians that are giving free online lessons uh, and that, that, that do connect you to other musicians and create other groups uh, where you can learn things. Um, using this time to focus on something, learning a new skill, uh, a new language, like I said, uh, I know you mentioned the animals. My only concern with the animals is that you need to be in it for the long haul. Uh, and you know, everyone goes back to work and then the animals are home alone. Um, but, um, but, but getting involved in an, in an online community with something that you maybe you always wanted to do, but never had the time to do. And let me, let me try that. Uh, yeah. there was, there are resources out there. Uh, again, like I said, uh, you know, music lessons for free and, uh, and, and similar things. Yeah. And I mean, it sort of dovetails with a lot of what we've been promoting in our professional development programs is to help structure your time and use this in a meaningful way that gets your mind off of, of some of the, yes. you know, the financial fear am I going yes. to be able to And structuring to your time, you mentioned, I mean, that's a, that, that's a point that I wanted to make too. I mean, it, all the running jokes going on now are, I'm going to take off my daytime pajamas and put on my nighttime pajamas. And, you know, if you're stuck at home all day and one day bleeds into the next and your sleep cycle gets all um, all screwed up because you end up staying up later and maybe sleeping later and then um, then you can't fall asleep and you get very anxious because you don't have that structure. But getting up the same time every day, getting showered, getting changed, putting on, putting on clothes uh, that you can leave the house in, even if you don't leave the house, uh, having an agenda, having a schedule, having a a list of things to do that day, and then the next day, and to have that structure is real important. So uh, that's what keeps us going. 
rather than wow. sort of fading back into that, uh, you know, couch potato uh, sloth. <laughs> yeah, I can see in the comments that, you know, like you said, immediately the jokes, they start flying in that, is there such thing as time anymore? It's this right. idea that everything <laughs> right. just seems to, to meld into. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have sort of an alarming uh, comment. It's not really a question in the Q&A, but it says, uh, is the health number the same as NYC well? Because when I called in the past, they seemed disappointed that I wasn't on the ledge yet. Um, really? Yeah. So is well, NYC not well something different than the Mental Health Association? Uh, I'm not. I, I, I'm not exactly sure since I'm based in New Jersey now. Uh, but I'm. I'm pretty sure the Mental Health Association is who runs uh, New York City well. That that line. Uh, they. Sh you know. They, they shouldn't be disappointed if if you're not like on the edge or on the ledge, as they say. Right, yeah. Especially in a time like now where people need to connect. Right. And what are some of the symptoms for, our, for ourselves, but also our friends, our neighbors, our family members? How do, you, how do you identify when people are starting to move towards the ledge as, as this past uh, person just? Um, speaking a lot about hopelessness uh, is one thing. Um, talk, I mean, a, a, a real red flag is talking about a plan. Um, oh, I live on the 30th floor. Sometimes I wish I could just go, you know, I sit on the balcony and I, you know, and I wonder. Sometimes people will throw out little, little hints like that. Uh, it's really the hopelessness and the talking about, uh, and sometimes making very off-color jokes around that. Mm -hmm. um, so you always want to be want to be mindful mindful of folks uh and and isolating more so than we have to isolate you know not answering the phone not answering emails um being very cryptic with communication um it's important to keep an eye on folks that you haven't heard from in a while right so uh at a very personal level i i run this uh sort of fledgling new york city book club and I've been thinking about focusing on other sort of uh, moments in history or areas that, that focus on sort of the tragedy. But I wonder uh, this idea of just focusing too much on the idea of, you know, do, you know, is there a saturation point or do you think that it's helpful to sort of have these comparative, you know, what were people going through in 1918 with the Spanish mm -hmm. flu, you know, mm -hmm. what, what really was Welfare Island? And, or do you think that it's, that it's sort of, uh, sort of a uh, unproductive fascination with with just looking into the well right uh, well i i think it really depends it really that's really individualized for different people some people um find a lot of comfort in getting a lot of information and seeing that oh these people in 1918 they got through it i mean obviously a lot didn't but 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 the society got through that and how did they get through that and what can we learn from that and what can we do uh, similarly, and what what do we need to do uh, differently? But you do make a good point about not sort of dwelling on the, the tragedy so much, uh, but starting to focus on well, you know, how can I change my life uh, for the better now going forward? Uh, mm -hmm. So one of the comments somebody said that they you know they learned video editing while they had time, um, you know, just sort of examples of all right now let's look forward and 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 what can we do to better ourselves. Okay, uh, we have another question from a member. My, my main question is how to deal with the transition. When we all of a sudden feel safe uh, staying home and not sure how to go back outside, you know, I think, yeah, I think this is going to be a big issue that we're sort of going to be very leery of interacting with one another. And as tour guides, right. especially, how are we going to alleviate our guests uh, from feeling like, you know, you're especially coming to New York, where I think people are going yes. to call it COVID central. I think this is a big fear uh, for a lot of us. Right. And I, 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 think, I, I think that's going to be an experience that we're going to learn as we go along. Uh, I'm sure people are going to take a lot of precautions initially. I'm sure masks are going to be, um, you know, you're going to see people wearing masks in New York for a long time um, and, and distancing, you know, uh, for, for a long time. Um, and I think it'll be interesting once the tour groups, like you said, start up again and see what people are going to be comfortable doing. Uh, and how, and are they going to be looking to you to provide some sort of a safety or not? 
because uh, we don't know if they're going to say to you, well, you're going to have masks for us or, you know, and these are the questions that we don't know. Um, but, uh, but, you know, one step at a time as far as getting out and, and each person, you know, each individual is going to be more comfortable, you know, one person can be more comfortable than somebody else in a given situation, I think, as long as everybody feels that they're protecting themselves with the level of whatever protection it is, whether it's distancing or protective uh, equipment that, um, that they can work with for themselves. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, Emma, our president, she has a question that she's been trying to muscle in here. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, um, so I'm home with my uh, college sophomore and my high school junior, and they have a wow. lot of anxiety about lots of things, you know, and children too. I know Christina has little ones. Um, any advice for the younger set? What should, you know, how can we as parents and perhaps their grandparents and aunties and uncles out there, um, how do we take care of the mental health of the younger set? Well, I just, I think the most important thing is that they feel heard, is that they feel that we're able, that we're listening to them. And again, listening doesn't mean agreeing, it just means listening and being as objective as we possibly can. Uh, the kids are going to have all sorts of different feelings. I have two of my own. I have a high schooler and a, and a grade schooler. And, um, you know, they're both dealing with it in different ways. Um, they're used to connecting online with their friends. You know, that's, uh, they're used to doing that. But they're also missing the, the, the interaction yeah. as well. Yeah. And they didn't think they would, but, but they yeah. are. Uh, uh, they may have an opinion about it that's completely different than ours or whether it's anger or, or, or not. And it's just about just creating an environment where they can say that to us and it's okay for them to feel that way. And we're not, we don't have to be able to fix it. Because as parents, that's what we wanna do. We wanna fix it. We wanna make it better. We can't change the outside environment. We can only make it as good as we can for them. Mm -hmm. And if they feel supported and heard by us, that's, uh, uh, then that's the best way we can get through it. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm also a college professor, and I have to say that I feel like there's this group, this demographic out there of these graduating seniors who are facing this job market that's just, it's, it's an abyss. And my, I feel like they're not being heard by the greater society, and I just feel right. really awful for these kids. I mean, they can't even walk for their graduation ceremony, and they, they're feeling real despair and... Uh, and they're still so young that they don't have these reference points like 9-11 or the 2008. But right. you know, it's, right. a, it's really hard for these young 20 year olds that uh, this is just not what they signed up for. Right. And I, exactly. I feel like, yeah, it's a, it's a tough nut and all these things, but uh, we really, we really thank you, Dan. Is there anything that you wanted to add that we didn't cover that you think is important for our membership to hear? No, I just, I just think, you know, in, in summary, really stay connected. Stay connected the best uh, the best way that you can, and and you know you mentioned the kids uh, the graduating seniors and stuff. They're really being gypped, and and they're going to have feelings about it. And and all too often they're going to hear, oh you'll be fine, don't worry, or you know, yeah, oh it's not yeah. that bad. It's you know yeah, but that's what they're hearing is, oh your your experience isn't important, you know, but it is. This you can only you only graduate college once. You only graduate high school once. It's the only time you can't you can't go back and do that again. Mm -hmm. uh, so not missing out on that experience is a big deal. So it's just important for us to be to be listeners. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, any other questions for our, my fellow board members? If not, I'm just going no. to hand it over to Emma. And no, thank you was, very much for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, thank and you. And I was just going to say thank you so much. It really that's that's it's such good, concrete, real advice for everybody. So um, it, it it's very very helpful. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to move on now. Hold on a second. Let me back to Gary re review. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think both speakers were, were great. And thanks you, uh, Christina and Kevin, are fantastic uh, moderators. That was really, um, really a 
good conversation. So uh, I hope everybody else and, and um, appreciated that and enjoyed it just as much as I did. So um, moving on, our next thing is our industry partner vote. Okay, so that'll be Mike Morgenthal. All right, Mike, so you're on. Okay. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's doing okay out there. I know we're about seven or eight minutes from the uh, time that some of you might be just peering outside to clap. Um, you, if you are a full voting member of GANIC, you should shortly be receiving a message uh, with a link to vote on Wild Apricot on our two industry partner applicants for tonight. Uh, the first is Moxie. It is a financial services app started by a former um, executive at Chase. Um, and it specifically targets the freelance and 1099 market. It is not just a um, financial planning site. They do investment things, but they also have functionality for invoicing and uh, figuring out your taxes in real time. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting app. Uh, and in the email you just got, you should have seen the link for, um, uh, for their website. Uh, of course, this was blasted out uh, about a week ago as well. So hopefully you guys had time to review it as well. Um, the second applicant is uh, Trip School, which is um, one of the co-founders is Mitch Bach, who is a GANIC member. Trip School um, does uh, training and education for uh, tour directors and guides and um, really offers a lot of interesting uh, content and uh, ways to uh, improve your skills uh, as a guide. So, um, and uh, their website is listed there as well. Uh, so uh, you, will, you should have received uh, the ballot, uh, which will take, if you're a full voting member, which will take you uh, to Wild Apricot for you to cast your vote. Uh, polling will remain open till about an hour after the meeting. Uh, so you don't have to vote this very second, but it is important that you do vote. And um, we appreciate both of these applications. And uh, if there are any problems accessing uh, the poll to vote, please uh, let us know at board at GANIC.org. And if there's any questions or comments right now, you can post them in the chat room. Uh, that's what we normally do at our regular meetings. Yeah, people yeah so you can put them, yeah, if questions. any, yeah, so I'll give everybody a moment to add any, um, if there are any questions or comments um, while, um, while we've got Michael here. I don't One know thing I will say while you guys are thinking of questions or comments uh, is that I find it very encouraging that we're still getting industry partner applicants at this point. So I think it's a testament to people's faith in the tourism and travel industry. I think it's also a testament to uh, what GANIC has been doing and that we're being recognized for having some sway in the tourism and travel industry. So, uh, so take that at face value, but I do think it's a good sign. Yeah, definitely. I definitely, definitely think so. So, okay, any, any questions? I don't see anything. Um, Okay. No, I think we're all set. Yeah, everyone will receive, um, you will receive a ballot to the address that we have for your wild apricot that you use to register with. Okay, that's, it'll just, it'll just go right to you, or right? you'll find it in your email. Okay. And then um, you'll have to be able to vote for it. Um, you can do that after the meeting. There's no need to, to do that right now. Okay, anything else, Mike, about the vote? No? That's it. Okay. All right, cool. All right, John's here. Um, yeah, you can see everyone should be seeing now the, um, we've got the entire board here except for um, Bob Gelber, but um, we're all here right now and ready for you. So our next part is, I'm going to um, read through the announcement of the revisions and additions to the GANIC bylaws. These were voted on by the um, executive board. We approved these at our last meeting. So under membership section A, the following will be added to our bylaws. Any member who has lapsed for more than two years must reapply as a new applicant, but will not be subject to the new member fee and would be exempt from the requirement of four membership meetings in a year before becoming a full member, okay? And under meeting section B, the bylaws will be changed to read as follows. Minutes of all membership meetings shall be posted on the GANIC website and be made available in print if requested. 
Minutes for executive board meetings can be made available to individual members upon request. Okay, so those are the two revisions to our bylaws that were approved by the executive board. You were all notified on this um, via email in the um, GANIC announcements, okay? All right, so we'll move on. Let's check the chat, anything there? If there's any discussion? Okay, all right, then moving on, I have to say this is very efficient <laughs> in this Zoom setting. So now we're going to do our um, committee reports. So what I just need to do, if you are going to be giving a committee report, I will turn you into a panelist for the time um, that you will give your report, okay? And so I'm adding Michael Dillinger right now um, on behalf of certification. So let me just make sure his volume is on, okay? So Michael, you here? Yes, I am. All right, long time to see. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to get this through before the big clap, okay? Okay. So, certification committee, well, the certification committee, we have been working on meeting on a weekly basis, sometimes twice a week, in order to create an online class for GANIC members who may wish to, particip to participate in Tour Your Own City, the initiative that is coming up. Oh, there goes the screams. Okay, if you guys want to take a break, everybody take a break and-, and I'm, clap. I'm, we'll I'm think think clap. Anyway. I hear them screaming so, outside. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously, if you guys want to get up and go clap, Please don't clap. Dillinger's going to clap. I'm clapping from New Jersey. I'm doing my little thing. Christina's upstate. We're all doing our, <laughs> our thing. Yes. Yes. So, all right. We'll wait. I mean, this is, this is just what we do at seven o'clock. Even here, I'm usually blasting some kind of music. Okay. All right. Patrick's gone to clap. Uh, I think we lost Michael just for a moment. We'll, we'll yeah. get him back. <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. Okay. All right. Uh, Maria Lena is clapping from Las Vegas. Yeah, I'm clapping from New Jersey as I do every night. Oh, Roosevelt Island. They do it at eight, apparently. They're in their own thing. I guess it takes longer for the clap to travel by tram. So, all right. So we'll hold on till Michael, um, Michael gets back. Roosevelt uh -huh. Island's in a time warp, right? It's in a time warp. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Tony DeSanti, you asked, uh, he said, I received an email by industry partners. Will amendments be coming the same way? Um, Tony, the amendments were sent actually in an announcement on April 30th. Okay. So, um, so that's, um, they were already sent. Um, we, they said they're sent a week, um, at least a week before a meeting. And so, yeah. All right. Oh, they're clapping now in Queens. It's slowly moving across. I see Mitch says they're clapping out in, um, out in Forest Hills. Okay. So we'll wait till Dillinger gets back. Um, but apart from that, everyone, oh, Dave Gardner is banging his pots and pans. Okay. All right. It's such a nice thing to do. And this it's Nurses Appreciation um, Day today. So you know, really appreciating them all. Okay. Oh, the Astoria clap is very punctual, uh, according to Matthew Baker. Okay. It's deafening in Inwood. Very nice. All right. So let's get Michael back in here and we'll keep going. Okay. While we're waiting, Emma, can I chime in on one thing? Sure, go ahead. Just tomorrow night at seven o'clock, there's going to be another flyover. This time it's not by the U.S. military, though. It's three jet plume aircraft are going to be flying over Manhattan, Queens, at Bronx, and the Bronx. Um, and the text I got is, please follow social distancing guidelines if viewing in public. So keep that in mind. I think uh, when we had the flyover last week, that caused a little consternation for some people. So yeah, people when you're doing your clapping tomorrow, keep your eyes out for three jet blue planes flying over the city. Uh, as a tribute to the frontline healthcare workers. Nice, nice. Well, okay. Um, yeah. Oh, then JetBlue gave good free flights to healthcare workers. That's great. That's great. Yeah, Christina, you and me too. We're clapping in the burbs. We're 
we're doing our thing. <laughs> okay, um, the fly over, um, Michael, oh, Mike, the flower you said was at seven? It's what the text I said, I got from the city said, plan flyover salute to honor our frontline healthcare workers. Three JetBlue aircraft will conduct a flyover salute of Manhattan, Queens and the Bronx on May the 7th at 7 p.m. The aircraft will fly at approximately 2,000 feet. Please follow social distancing if viewing in public. All right, Michael, come back. I'm I see. Right. I'm back, I'm back. <coughs> All right. I have to do it. I have two nieces and a sister that are all frontline in hospitals. Got to do it. Oh, yes. All right. Bravo. Thank you. Okay. okay. Hi. So now I don't have to rush. Okay. So just to give a little background, so the, the certification committee, when it became apparent that the, um, the first resurgence of tourism would probably be day trippers coming in from nearby, we thought, wouldn't it, why don't we have a program we can help guides get ready for this? And that's where the, the impetus of this, this program was born. It was to create a workshop so that guides could work on crafting a tours that speak to the local traveler as opposed to people who will only be here once in their lifetime. So that was the idea. And we started working on this and it's a really, really big lift, even though it's only a small part of what certification does, but trying to put it online and make it accessible to everybody has been quite a challenge. So we've been meeting on a weekly basis, and there are some weeks we've met twice a week to get it all done. And this, this is one of the weeks where we're meeting twice this week as well to get this done for members who want, may want to participate. The um, application deadline has passed. So now we're reviewing the applications, and then the end of this week, we're doing a little online interview with each of the applicants so we can whittle, whittle it down. We can't take everybody. Uh, it's, and this is the initial outing, but we hope that, um, that this, we will be able to do this more and more and more, offer this more, more often. It's a three session workshop, it takes place over one week. And uh, the first <coughs> class is gonna begin on May 11th. So we're really getting up on it. It will be limited in size. And uh, as I said, the deadline has passed. We have also developed not only working with, with Zoom, but we have an online learning management system that we've invested in that, so we can put everything up there so that it will be easily replicatable as well. And all the information, all of the um, resources that are needed for the class will all be there. We're very excited about getting all of this done. The, so we'll be making the final decision on participants at the end of this week. And they'll be notified with the link and, the, and they'll be getting their um, homework assignments and everything else. And we'll keep you updated on all of this. Um, but since it's a very new process for the committee, any decision on future classes will be made after this first one is complete. So I cannot give you any dates on anything that might be happening in the future at this time. One other thing I do want to say, I have to tell you, I am in awe of these committee members they all should take a bow. They all deserve your thanks and your gratitude. They are Jonathan Turr, Patrick Casey, Nina Mende, Kevin Lawrence, Billy Nemec, Kit Garrett, and our very own COVID warrior, Robin Gar. They have shown up <laughs> every single meeting. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you, guys. You are awesome. Thank so you, everyone. That is my report, unless anybody has any questions. Yeah, how many people applied? Uh, we've got over, well, I don't know, more, more than a dozen. I don't know the exact number. And at least one of them has decided maybe they're not gonna do it this time. We've got different you know, responses. We'll see what happens. Okay, great, great. All right, thank you, Michael. Any questions in the chat? Jeremy, are there any questions in chat about that for Michael? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, no, I'm not seeing any. Okay. Well, all right. It's up on here, so. Okay. All right. So let me, Michael. We're gonna bid you your adieu and um, bye bye. We're going to. All right. Let me take. Okay, Michael off. All right. Change your attendee, and then let me get our next in. We've got Nina. Okay, so Nina, get ready because you'll be on in just a moment. All right. Okay, there we go. All right, so Nina should be popping in shortly. Okay, there we go.
All right, so Nina, let me get her on. Okay, and let me try to get your, your video on. Nina, you all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, here we are. All right, I guess we can't, we can't, we just can't see you. All right. Okay. Um, oh, I guess so. I'm doing it from a laptop. It should have, is there anything I should, oh, wait, I can click. Okay. There we are. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is uh, the education committee. We've been meeting uh, often uh, to develop uh, the online professional development programs and uh, Bob Gelber and, uh, and Ke uh, uh, Kevin Lawrence and Jeremy Wilcox and John Semlack. We have four people on the board who are on the committee as well as this uh, uh, Andrea Coyle and myself and Minna, Minna Sharp and Susan Birnbaum and Lisa Puccio. So that, that's the core. And we also, uh, as a report, we opened up a new Facebook page and we started in, it's by invitation, but it's really open to people who want to do, uh, have ideas, education ideas. Um, and uh, that's the education uh, contributors page. So we really welcome GANIC members who want to develop programming for the education committee. Uh, just, you know, email us and we'll make you part of it. Uh, we uh, just, uh, what we've been, uh, I just want to thank people for doing the uh, adapting to virtual touring practical issues related to producing, conducting, sustaining online tourism. And, Parts uh, and thank for all the people who put that together. And that was um, Kevin Lawrence from moderating, and Kelsey Toner was the expert. And then our own Gannick members, part two, with Kevin Fitzpatrick, Megan Mayrod, and Jeremy Wilcox. So uh, it's a nice combination of professional and then also pulling in from our membership people who have expertise, sharing it with us. Uh, we're, we're in the process of uh, developing uh, FAM tours, uh, uh, virtual FAM tours um, and for membership. And now we have sort of a hybrid situation where, in the meantime, we're promoting uh, all, all organic members who are sort of pioneers in this form. And uh, Jeremy is putting it on his pub public relations page, the blog. Um, and uh, really, uh, we're, we're going through a lot here, but we're, we're pioneers developing another way of reaching out to people. It, it reminds me of the old uh, film industry that started in Fort Lee, New Jersey. I, I saw a special on uh, Frances Gee, the first woman filmmaker, and I was thinking how many of us now going through all the things we're going through are giving birth to something new with these virtual tours. And I think they'll be around. And uh, I'm excited that the Education Committee is uh, doing, doing something with that. I, I just want to say a, a special thank you. Uh, some people are doing a lot of tours targeted to GANIC members. We didn't put them on Wild Apricot because they were you know, a big series. And that, that was a lot of bandwidth. But uh, Art and Susan Zuckerman have been doing tours twice a week uh, with open part and, and uh, Joe Safe Black did a Coney Island segment and I think Cindy was trying, Cindy Delapita is doing the uh, 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 Gustavino Tile, Erica Becker, Matt Baker, Mike Zuccavolo and Joe Safe Black were, were on another segment. So this, and these were uh, by conference call. So he, I think now uh, Art Zuckman is going to Zoom, but Kevin Pitts, I mean, there's a whole bunch of pioneer I say our pioneers, and even though they're not doing this for education per se, I mean, they're doing it for some other operators and they're charging like, and, and these tours are like $10 or, so we, we're promoting their work because they're, they're pioneers and hopefully they'll, they'll be, once we get going again, uh, uh, they'll be a part of it. And I just want to give you know, like a heads up for all your you pioneers, Gary Dennis and Karen Noasad and Stanley O'Connor and Michael Morgenthau, Lemmy Gonzalez, Mitch Bach, 
Kenneth Fitzpatrick, Matthew Baker, Megan, uh, Megan Mayrod, Jeremy Wilcox, Manuela Biondi, Linda Fisher, Fred Fancer, uh, Slava Spiegel, Yu Wang, um, and uh, I, I'm sure I, I left, if I left a couple of people out, I'm sorry, but you know, you're all, thank you for publicizing your tours so we know about them and we can learn from you. And uh, I, I guess uh, that that's it for now. We're in the process of developing all kinds of wonderful things. I really thank you to the board for just doing just doing such a great job, getting you know creating a community of guides. This you know it's a rough time for everyone, and I really thank the board for you know holding us together. And we're um, we're, we're you're and you're we're very creating, welcome. Well, yeah, I, want to, I just want to say this. We're such a diverse organization that the education contributors page is for multilingual guides, it's for double-decker guides. It's, we have such diversity and such wonderful humanity in our organization that, you know, just a big hug to everyone. Oh, thank you, Nina. Thank you so much. That's really kind, very kind of you. Um, any questions um, uh, for Nina? Um, uh, I think we're sort of just doing a little scan through. I think, I think we're good. Okay, Nina. So thank you so very much. Thank you so very much. Yeah. So I'm going to switch you out back to attendee and I'm going to be bringing in Andy side or here. Okay. So let me take Nina off. All right. And I'll add Andy. Okay. All right. So, so Andy should be coming in in just a moment. Okay. All right. So let's see. Is he in? All right. Andy? All right. Let's unmute Andy. Sorry. Hold on a second. Takes a moment. All right. Andy, you're all set? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. There yes, we go. Great. All right. Okay. Good to see you. I am Theodore, Government Relations. Uh, this report will cast back into March as well. Uh, in early March, as COVID-19 cases started in March, we made another round of the remaining holdouts on City Council regarding, regarding INT 289A. Uh, that's the bill for uh, requiring guides on double-decker buses. Uh, while we did get a few responses, the needle has not moved uh, with us still at the same number of votes as before. Then the lockdown occurred. Uh, meetings and hearings we were scheduled to attend were canceled and government act mental activity, particularly on the local level, ground to a halt. But that doesn't mean we have lost purpose, quite the contrary. The crisis is the worst thing to ever hit the tourist industry in its history. And I say that with the perspective of one who's worked through 9-11 blackouts, hurricanes, earlier pandemics, and the FBL Yoko. All activity is suspended. We are all unemployed. The unemployment insurance system has become completely overwhelmed. It was never designed to handle even a fraction of the numbers it handles now. There's also the problems posed by the crisis itself. While social distancing has flattened the curve, we still have nearly 300 deaths a day in a city that saw a grand total of 311 murders in the whole year of 2019. We need more testing and without federal support, that necessity is not going to be achieved. There's not a lot we can do about this. Our federal reps in New York and New Jersey, where many of Danix members reside, are already in agreement on this point, but can't get past the roadblock of the Senate and the presidency. But there are things to do now and in the future. Toward that end, we've compiled a database of Danix members and tax profits referencing their representatives at the federal, state, and for NYC residents, local. I've been able to do this for 397 of our members and contacts. In the past, when we had to pressure a particular rep, we would ask who was in that person's district and ask them to write letters or make calls. Now, when we need to pressure a rep, we can swift look up all we have in that district and then ask all of those to act. This will greatly strengthen our lobbying efforts in the future. Moving into April, the City Council managed to cobble together a meeting after a month of no council activity where they're able to pass a bill that basically extends some of the protections and aids already offered by the state and city. Is it enough? No, not really. But it's more and is positive action by a branch that has had its ability to act at all severely curtailed. 
So we have decided to support this bill. Committee member Christina Lombardi has done a full workup on this all, uh, that has already been posted to you all by GANIC and statements of support have been written by myself and others. That more needs to be done is really the point. The crisis um, has no real end in sight, but when it does end, we have the long work of reconstruction to accomplish. At that point, INT 289A will be more important than ever. Our partners at TW100, which has been heavily hit by the virus, have told us that they see it as more essential than ever. More, meanwhile, we need to monitor our reps to see who is acting on this crisis and use these actions to remind them of our presence. Recently, committee member Lionel Hamanaka did a cursory round of pulling up city council members to see who's still responsive. responsive. Basically, it ran the range from very active to practically shut down. Um, we need to cultivate relationships with the very active to position ourselves for the future. Now that concludes the statement. Uh, something else to add is I am stepping aside as the chair. I will still be active on the committee and the new chair will be Christina Lombardi, who I believe has a short statement to make at this point. Thank you, Andy. Um, I wanna start by thanking Andy for all the work that he's done with the Government Relations Committee, um, particularly with respect to the legislation about keeping tour guides on tour buses um, and the Swift Lookup program, which he just briefly mentioned, it is going to make it so much easier for us to target individual members uh, of the city council or particular officials um, and let everyone who is in that district know simultaneously, hey, we need you to reach out to this person and here's why. Um, going forward, Gannick is going to be supporting the COVID-19 uh, legislation that was proposed by Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, I agree with Andy that it doesn't go far enough but it is a start. Um, you had a summary of that legislative, legislative proposal in the last edition of the Virgil. Um, there's gonna be a petition forthcoming. We would love to have membership sign it, pass it along to fellow tour guides, fellow industry professionals, even if they're not members of GANIC. Uh, there is strength in numbers, as we were saying during the freelance talk earlier this evening. So we wanna get as many signatures in support of the proposal as possible. Um, and there'll be more information in the coming issue of the Virgil. We'll follow up on what we're talking about tonight. Yes, and I'd like to echo what Christina said and also what, um, what everyone is what, I'm getting a lot of comments in the chat um, to thank you very much, Andy, especially because you were just sort of pushed into this role and um, you really picked up with it. So thank you very much. Um, for that and um, for keeping on the committee and keeping doing great work, of course, you and Lionel and, um, and now uh, Christina. So congratulations, Christina Chair, and thank you again, Andy. Okay, so um, Andy, <laughs> so big applause for Andy there. So Andy, I'm going to put you back to being an attendee. Again, right. thank you very much. And we're gonna go on to next, which is uh, me actually um, putting my IT um, chair cap on and um, just to let you all know that uh, the, the zoom organic zoom that we're using right now actually um, is now accessible it's going to be accessible to committee chairs all the board members can log in and a lot of the board members are on most of the committee so I think everybody is covered and the way this will work is basically if your committee needs to hold a zoom meeting you can go, it can be set up and um, you're welcome to have that meeting. And it's really just first come, first serve. You can see if you, um, when you go into the Zoom panel, you'll see a list of all the meeting dates and the meeting times, okay? And so people can just work around that. And so just to make sure um, that way, all the committees, you know, we're getting busier and busier. And so this is a good way for everyone to keep in touch. And so we'll have our one, um, GANIC Zoom meeting, okay? And um, any questions for IT in, if you have a question for me? Um, but that's, that's, really, that's really it, okay? So next we have, um, let me just check the chat one more time really quickly. Okay, and so, and yes, and just to keep in mind, guys, if you want to make sure your comments in the chat go to everybody, um, so so you're, the rest of the members can see it, make sure it says a panelists and all to, um, to everyone, okay? All right, so I'm going to next um, add Derek, okay? If you, I beg your 
patience a moment. Okay, Derek. Okay, so he'll be popping in in just a moment. Okay, let me see. All right, so. Okay, hi everybody. Hey, Derek. So my name is uh, Derek Chan. I'm the uh, membership committee chair. And first of all, I just wanted to give an extra special welcome to anybody who's at this meeting who's not a GANIC member and who's visiting for the very first time. We're uh, certainly glad that you're able to uh, join us and whether you're local in the New York City or New Jersey area or not, uh, we are certainly glad that you're here. And if you're not a GANIC member, just wanted to note that now is actually a great time to join GANIC for a number of reasons. And just as a general reminder, the main requirement to being a GANIC member is being a licensed New York City guide. And uh, we don't have any residency requirements. We do have guides uh, who are part of GANIC that are not from the New York City area. And um, we absolutely welcome that. We've actually just recently had uh, a couple of guides that have uh, joined us from the DC area. We also have had in the past, uh, currently, DC guides uh, even before the current um, kind of round of, uh, of numbers. Um, so we are, are of course accepting uh, new applications. Um, if you're organic member in the past and want to rejoin, we're welcome, um, welcome you back as well. And also just want to give a, a extra special thank you to uh, organic member and a DC area resident Jim Carr, who's actually been quite instrumental in um, bringing in some of those uh, DC guides. Um, just as a financial note, right now for new members, the first year's regular dues are currently prorated, so they're 50% off right now. So normally uh, annual dues right now are $125, so $62.50 plus the uh, membership initiation fee, and everything can be done um, online. And a lot, just as a reminder, that a lot of our current member benefits have moved online. We've heard um, a lot about that very recently from our um, committee chairs. Uh, uh, Michael Dillinger was talking about some of the things that the certification committee is doing. Um, their certification normally had been done in person, but they're having some virtual offerings and it sounds like perhaps there might be uh, some more in the future. Uh, Nina was just talking about some of the things that the education committee has been doing. Uh, recently, there were two of the uh, virtual uh, PDPs that were offered to members about um, creating and hosting and kind of nuts and bolts of virtual tours. And also related to that, uh, all organic members are members of the NFTGA, the National Federation of uh, Tours Guide Associations. Just um, a little bit earlier this afternoon, some of us were on the, uh, the Zoom webinar that was hosted um, by NFTGA um, about uh, virtual tours as well. So there's a lot of great things that are going on, opportunities connect with our uh, colleagues uh, throughout the country, even throughout the world also part of the World Federation of Tour Guides as well, conferences associated with that. So there's a lot of great things going on. Michael Dillinger will be talking a little bit later about the uh, uh, Tour Your Own City uh, initiative that he's been spearheading. There's a special member benefit for that. So if you're not a member and you're saying, hey, I want to join, just go to the website, danic.org slash apply, and I'll put that in um, the chat as well. Also, uh, I know this is a lot about people who are not members. Uh, for our existing members, also just a, a special thank you to you as well, because certainly GANIC is everything because of our members. And uh, if we didn't have any members, you really would be nothing. And so just a reminder that um, besides these member benefits that I've just mentioned, uh, there's a summary page on the GANIC website for members only. You have to log in, ganic.org slash benefits. And it has a listing of um, many of the benefits that I've just discussed, as well as a few others. Um, things, of course, are different now, but uh, fam tours, site visits, newsletters, job fairs, a special member benefits for that as well. Um, since our last meeting, we have actually added seven new members. And I just wanted to recognize them at uh, this time. We have six new provisional members, Andrea Kropman, Anna Uva Galvano, Christina Menka, Mary Beth Oaks, Joy Steinbach, and Sarah Lyons. We also have uh, one new full member who's actually come back after being away with us for a short time here, Carol Siedelman. So welcome to uh, those seven new members. We currently have a total of 367 active members for GANIC, 
and that number is certainly rising. And um, so that's uh, how we're doing as far as that. Um, as far as the membership committee, in terms of uh, some of the things that we've done in the past, we had done uh, in-person uh, GANIC networking happy hours. Those, of course, are not happening right now. Uh, but we're in the process of um, planning for a virtual happy hour of sorts, uh, maybe a sort of a talent showcase. So if uh, anybody's interested in uh, showcasing your talent, you can email me, membership at uh, GANIC. Dot, uh, org and I'll um, I'll put that in the uh, chat as well so you have that as well so that's it for me unless uh, anybody has any questions and if yeah if anyone has questions um please type them up in the please write them in the chat um, and I see some questions went by also for panelists who had spoken before if you put them in the chat everyone will see those um, Kevin Fitzpatrick, you have a question. If you could just type that in the chat, that would be great. I see your hand um, is raised. Okay. All right. So um, let's see, do we have anything? Okay. Here we go. Yeah. And so um, Derek just put up the link um, right there. Thank you, Derek. Okay. And all right, thank you, Derek. This is great. Um, oh yeah, virtual happy hour. That's a good suggestion from um, Kevin Fitzpatrick. A virtual happy hour. I think actually um, there was some talk on the, in the virtual tours um, business about um, you know these these chefs and mixologists demonstrating things. So um, perhaps Kevin could give us a a lesson in um, making some of his great cocktails that he has on his on his um, blog and that would be a lot of fun and we could all, we could all try it out. Um, we were making margaritas at home last night with my family and with various results, okay? All right, so thank you very much, Derek. All right, we're gonna move on to um, Dave Gardner. Thank you, Derek, I'm gonna take you off now and then we're gonna move on to uh, Dave Gardner, okay? He's gonna be um, jumping in. Uh, okay, so. Just a moment. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Dave should be in in just a moment. Okay. All right, I'll just make sure his is on. Dave. Okay, and there we go. Okay. So Dave, are you here? Uh, yep, coming in. Yes. Oh, he's gonna jump. I knew he's gonna jump. Good evening, everybody. I don't welcome everybody. You like my lanyard. So, uh, first of all, uh, yes, I've let myself go a little bit, but have you noticed that all five of the males have opted to be clean shaven? Just had to say. So, well done, everybody, for addressing the bad issues. I'm here to address a good issue tonight. This is a copy of our newest issue of our newsletter guidelines. It's in the mail, so it's on its way to y'all, uh, but uh, I have a preview copy of myself, so, and well done. Uh, typically, pages are in multiples of four. I expected this to just be a 12-pager, but thanks to everybody, it has been a full 16-pager as usual, but there's uh, things that we do address about the current thing, like Judy, and, uh, you know, past things like tours, and so on, and so on, and of course, Big words from our president, Emma, <laughs> and two pages. Uh, but anyway, it's in the mail for people who have opted to be getting their hard copies, and I'll give you information about anybody else that would like to get their own hard copies about that. And since I know you will ask, the deadline for the next one will be July 28th. That's the day that Mel Brooks, a New Yorker, born in Brooklyn, is due to turn 94. <laughs> That's great. And then, Dave, of course, you'll, um, this will be posted on the website. Yes. Excellent, Emma. Uh, yes. Uh, there will be a copy of this in glorious Technicolor posted on our website. And typically, there's some additional things. I'll put in a few extra pictures or maybe extra contributions. And <coughs> We're not limited to four on the website, so it'll be something enhanced in some way. Yes. Great. 
All right, great. Thank you so much, Dave. That's wonderful. And if you, if you hold it up, I love the hat. I love the hat and the mustache. <laughs> that's, that's really good. That's what, we, that's what we all need. So thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. All right, so let's, um, I'm going to be taking Dave out now. <laughs> it's a breath of fresh air here. And um, we are going to move to our last. We're going to have John Semlak actually will be reading the report on behalf of Ibrahima for the, um, for the sustainable tourism. Okay. All right. So let's get John unmuted. All right. Okay. John, you should be all Can set. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, Emma? Okay, yes. great. Uh, and thank you. And I do, um, uh, thanks all the committee heads for their reports, by the way, as the secretary who sends out the reminders. I am not a member of the uh, Sustainable Tourism renamed from Over Tourism Committee, uh, but I'm just reading it as secretary on behalf of Ibrahima. So uh, with uh, start in the past several weeks, our committee's main concerns have changed from overcrowding, among other things, to virtually a different type of focus. It's fair to say that some of us wish we still had the problem today, as Gerard said, Jared said, pardon me. Um, uh, but over tourism is not just about crowded popular sites. In fact, in Europe, the trend is to call it responsible tourism. It would be laughable to maintain just as, uh, even just internally the name over tourism committee. So we had to rebaptize ourselves as the sustainable tourism committee with the same goals and mission. We know there is going to be a new normal in our, so our approach has changed. Since there may be social distance <coughs> for a while, uh, group tours and activities won't be the same anymore or without masks, whisper systems or not, in small areas especially. This is why we have been, <clears throat> been working on best practices and guidelines for tourism professionals in, charges of, in charge of groups a digital manual that will be considered as a go-to for reference for anything related to leading groups. This includes safety, sizes, seasons, subways, etc. Uh, everything a lot of us know already and practices put together as industry standards. I repeat, I repeat tourism industry standards for group activities, mainly tour related. We must lead by example. For that to happen, we have to think, act, and react according to the same guidelines and not just assume that we all know that it's obvious. All know it's obvious, pardon me. Uh, we have to share with everyone in our industry what we recommend so we will work together towards safer activities and better experiences for visitors and locals. Our committee held three meetings in the, la in the past weeks thanks to everyone who attended those online meetings. Uh, uh, committee Chair Ibrahim Mandiala. Uh, thank you, Emma. That's uh, that's the it. Okay. I, I, okay. All right. Great. Thank you very much, um, John. And I know, um, and I'm actually on the um, Sustainable uh, Tourism Committee, and um, this idea of putting together some some guidelines for when we're back to um, touring um, is really. It's very interesting, and Ibrahima has a, a lot of good things, um, got a lot of good thoughts on that, and can take a lot of ideas from other members of the um, of the committee. Okay, so um, Okit has a question. Let me see what that is about sustainable tourism. Um, where is this going to be published? So, Kit, it's it's still um, these are points of discussion um, that the sustainable tourism committee is dealing with. Okay, so it's not um, any finished document that's out there yet um, the committee is actually working on it actively right now okay so um, let's move on now we have uh, an update from Mike Morgenthal uh, about the um, tour your own city initiative so take it away Mike okay thanks Emma uh, just two quick things before I launch into this um, I didn't submit a formal industry relations committee report I apologize for that but two things that that I wanted to mention. Number one, the Society for Illustrators was approved from last month. The uh, vote total is in the minutes, which were posted to 
organic.org. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, you also heard that um, some, one of our other uh, board members mentioned this, but we made a decision that um, our, at least our next three meetings uh, are gonna be held virtually like this, uh, June, July, and August. We are holding our breath that September, our annual general meeting will be able to take place in person. Uh, we have not secured a venue yet. We're working on it. Obviously, it's uh, a little tough at this moment because nobody really knows what's going on, but that is our hope is that we will all be able to get to see each other again in person uh, in the fall or in the late summer, I guess I should say. So, uh, but be that as it may, uh, let me turn our attention to tour your own city. So I'm going to share my screen here so you guys can see what's going on. And because and I'm just going to go full screen. There we go. Okay. So um, we have been working really hard, uh, myself, uh, members of the board, some members of the Industry Relations Committee, uh, Deborah Blau, who designed that beautiful logo that you see up there at the top, and um, Megan Murad and Amada Anderson to start to get this up and running. And what you are looking at right now is the landing page for Tour Your Own City. Uh, we are not ready to launch yet. Uh, we've had a lot of internal discussions about when and how we want to launch. Um, we need to make sure we are very sensitive to timing um, because we don't want to be perceived as to be encouraging people to take tours while people are still suffering, people are still getting sick, people are still dying in mass numbers. So we're going to be paying very close attention to that, but we're doing the ramp up right now. And that's what this is all about. So uh, I'll just walk you guys really briefly through this um, through this homepage, uh, landing page. Uh, more is coming, I'm sure by uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have more to share with you and certainly by the June meeting. But you can just see as I scan through here, we're specifically targeting, and some of the formatting on this is not perfect. We're still continuing to tweak it, but you can see the formatting uh, or the, we're calling uh, people within the New York general area come to New York City. And then we have a sign up to subscribe. If you're a tour guide or tour operator interested in having tours listed on the site, or if you're a member of the public and you wanna get updates once we launch. Uh, now, this is a very, very key point. If you are a GANIC member, full or provisional, you do not need to sign up for this. You will, once we start accepting, uh, once we have the application to start uploading tours, you will get that automatically uh, via email. Uh, and I'm sure we'll post it on our internal social media as well. So, but if you are a licensed New York City tour guide uh, or a tour operator who's going to be interested in posting your tours on Tour Your Own City, um, once this launches, you can certainly subscribe, uh, put your information in. If you click subscribe like I'm doing right now, you'll be taken to a little uh, MailChimp sign up thing. Really, really simple. First name, last name. Are you a tour guide, tour operator, or are you a member of the public? And this way we have lists to send people's information to. Um, let's see, go back to the main page. Uh, there is a fee for non GANIC guides and for tour operators. Uh, similar to how we have operated our uh, job fair uh, in the past. So uh, for GANIC members, this is a completely free service. For non-GANIC members and for tour operators, there is a fee. And the theory behind that is that um, many of these tour operators, even non-GANIC guides, do occasionally do hire GANIC guides uh, to uh, lead tours. So the idea is a rising tide lifts all boats. And if we're able to demonstrate to the public that it is fun and safe to go out and take tours, uh, that's going to be good for members of GANIC in addition to the entire guiding community. Um, one fun thing that we threw in here is some great quotes uh, that we found about New York, specifically about the uh, belief of New Yorkers. And uh, we can kind of scan through these uh, a little bit. The true New Yorker simply believes that people living anywhere else have to be, in some sense, kidding. Thank you, John Updike. Um, I still believe in the possibilities then, still have the sense. So peculiar to New York that something extraordinary would happen any minute, any day, any month by Joan Didion. I'm not gonna read all of them. Uh, and obviously the famous Cole Porter line that uh, our dearly departed Lee Gelber loved so well. Um, so uh, just kind of an enticement for New Yorkers to see how much we need them. And when I say New Yorkers, I mean New York area people. 
Um, and then there's a brief description of what's going on here, why this is important. Uh, kind of the third paragraph is kind of the, the, the key. By booking tours, members of the public will not only get out and explore the greatest city in the world, but they'll also be bought, supporting small businesses that took a direct hit as a result of COVID-19. Uh, travel is going to be one of the last sectors of our economy to bounce back, so we need New York area residents to take New York tours. It'll be a lifeline for the thousands of working tour guides here in New York City and the small businesses we patronize as well. We're going to emphasize the fact that on a lot of these tours, we patronize other small businesses, so there's kind of an echo effect as well. And then we have a couple of little fun photos down here at the bottom and another way to subscribe. So that is basically the home, the landing page. And that's what's going to be up on the website until uh, it is time for us to start launching. However, you will get that application when we are ready to do it. We're doing some testing on it. We're uh, kind of just finishing the back end. Amada has been working quite hard. And if you know Amada, you know that she is 7.75 uh, months pregnant at this point and working a full-time job. And yet she is still doing most of the web work for us. Uh, I know she's not on this call, but uh, we greatly um, appreciate that. Um, I'm going to exit uh, full screen mode here, I think, so that I can possibly answer some questions. But uh, Emma, or if you had see some questions for me, I'm just having a little trouble getting, oh, here we go. Yeah. Yeah, there are some questions. I'll just read them out to you, Mike, on the questions okay. of actually in the Q&A. Yep. Um, so will there be a limited number of tours listed on the Tour Your Own City website? And what is the criteria for being considered? That's from Catherine Hill. Great question, Catherine. Thank you so much. Um, so let me uh, answer the second question first. All tours uh, will be vetted by GANIC administrators before they get posted to the website. Um, that is to uh, just make sure that they're not, uh, that they're appropriate, uh, that there's nothing kind of crazy going on there. Um, you know, for GANIC guides, certainly we already know who you are. Uh, so I would anticipate that every tour will get approved, but we just want to make sure that, uh, that everything is up to standards. Uh, by the way, as kind of a corollary to that, the, the non-GANIC guides and the tour operators will have to apply via Wild Apricot so they can pay their fee. Um, and uh, we are requiring that the tour operators specifically um, pledge uh, or show that they only hire licensed New York City tour guides. We will not accept tours from any tour operator that are known to hire non-licensed guides. Uh, the second question in terms of how many tours will you be able to list? Uh, the answer is as many as you like. The way we are planning to do this, and again, we're still building out the back end of the system, but the way we're planning to do this is that it'll kind of be, uh, each listing will be housed under a guide's name or a tour operator's name. Uh, the members of the public we will be able to search for tours by topic, by location, by language, by type of tour, public, private, bus, vehicle, things like that. Uh, but then at the bottom, you know, when you click on that specific tour, uh, there'll be a, a button at the bottom that says, if you're interested in other tours by this tour guide, click here, and then they'll get a full list of your tours. Now, one thing I want to stress once again, this is not an e-commerce site. We are not booking tours directly through this site. Those sites, uh, those links uh, that we're going to post that you guys will upload to the site will link to your websites so they can book directly with you. Uh, we're doing this for two reasons. Number one, we don't want to get involved in the commerce par part of it. Uh, once you have a potential client, that's between you and them to work out the details or any disputes that may arise or questions or things like that. And number two, uh, we didn't want to take any commission. We don't want, uh, and we'd like local New Yorkers to book directly through you, not through various OTAs that would take a, a sizable commission. So the idea is to get as much revenue as possible into your hands directly. Um, so like I said, we're still kind of building out the architecture of it, but that is yeah. how we hope it's going to function. I hope that- Okay, yeah, and there are a couple more questions uh, specifically about, um, you know, if a GANIC member is a tour operator, do they have to register separately? Um, if a GANIC member is a tour operator, do they have to operate separately? So do, for the purposes- yeah, Do register separately. Reg register separately. For the purposes of this, uh, program. Uh, we're defining tour operators as uh, major, uh, as companies that predominantly hire multiple tour guides to run their tours. If you are a GANIC guide who mostly runs your own tours, 
um, who mostly runs your own tours. Uh, and you know, once in a while you hire another guide to cover for you if you're uh, double booked or something like that, then you are not considered a tour operator. You'll be considered a tour guide. Um, if you're a tour operator and you are a Gannick industry partner, uh, you will not have to pay the additional fee. But if you're a large company that hires lots of guides, uh, we are going to ask you to pay uh, the $95 fee. It's basically the same cost as becoming an industry partner. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the questions was, what is the fee? I'm not sure. Uh, for Gannick guides, this is completely free. For non-Gannick licensed New York City guides, uh, it'll be $35 to have a listing with as many tours as you like on the site. Um, and that is through October 31st, 2020. Um, that is the end of our fiscal year. We'll certainly reevaluate when we get there if this is still necessary. And as I mentioned, for tour operators, the fee will be $95, which is the cost of becoming an industry partner. And again, that will be uh, to have your tours listed through the end of October of this year. Uh, and we'll reevaluate at that time uh, what needs to happen with this program, depending on what's going on in the world. And then last question, will the listing um, be for walking tours or virtual, um, for walking tours only or also for virtual and slash self-guided tours as well? Uh, great question. So um, we will have a listing for virtual tours, but it is not, not our intent to make that a major separate push. If people are interested in finding virtual tours, they can check that on the checkbox and see it, uh, see those tours that are available. Uh, but the main goal of this project is for when we are allowed to start leading tours again to encourage local New York area residents to take tours because uh, as most travel industry experts are predicting, even once uh, the quarantine is lifted, uh, it's going to take a while for travel to bounce back, both because of economic issues uh, and travel infrastructure issues. So the idea behind this is to really market tours to local area New York uh, residents. So New York, Long Island, Westchester, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, with the idea that they can get into New York City fairly easily uh, to take tours. So that is really the goal, um, the mission of Tour Your Own City. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Now, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, or... Okay, perfect. And we'll go back to seeing everyone in just a moment um let's see any more oh, there are two more questions up there yeah i can um, answer them while i'm doing this so just okay perfect perfect thank you okay all right oh there we go yeah all right great so yeah could you, do you see those questions now Mike? i do so uh debbie mason yeah uh will private tours be marketed also absolutely this is not just about public tours any kind of tour that is given in new york city public private as you heard, virtual as well. Uh, there will be options to search for those. One other thing that I wanted to mention as well is that um, we are going to have kind of a separate uh, classification or notification for organic members. Uh, even though we're offering this to the tour guide community at large, we, this is a GANIC initiative. So GANIC members will kind of be, you know, to quote George Orwell, first among equals, I guess. Uh, so uh, we, we felt that that was a very important thing for, uh, for our members to, um, uh, to enjoy, perk to enjoy. Uh, the other question uh, from Robin London, how will this be advertised? That's kind of the next phase we're moving into right now. We've had a lot of discussions internally about um, what our PR uh, direction will be. Uh, one of the things will be a heavy social media um, uh, push. Uh, which is being spearheaded by Megan Murad, who uh, those of you who tuned into the PDP the other day uh, know she has kind of become a bit of a uh, social media maven and uh, she's been coming up with lots of good ideas. Uh, and uh, we are curating press lists uh, and we are discussing whether we want to pay for advertising or not. We haven't gotten there quite yet. Great. Um, any other questions? I see one more popped up. Yeah, uh, so it's just kind of a repeat question from uh, from Bill Goodhart. Uh, once we are once we start accepting tours to be uploaded to the site, all Gannick members will receive an email so that they can start uploading their tours. As I said, the tours will still have to be um, okayed by a Gannick administrator, 
Um, so, and we're asking everybody to give us 48 hours from the time you submit uh, your tours to the time you would see them live on the site. So no forms yet, you guys don't have to do anything yet, uh, but we just wanted to update you, show you kind of the landing page and uh, let you know that things are progressing uh, and uh, stay tuned. Great, so thank you, Michael. Thank you, Amada. I know she's not here, but um, really huge applause to all of you. Megan Murad, I know she's editing videos like mad and you've really, everybody's been working really incredibly hard on this. So, oh, so actually, thank Emma, you one more thing. Oh yeah, sure. I just wanted to say a big thank you to those of you who submitted videos for the intro video that we are, uh, that Megan is editing together to kind of explain this process for those who don't want to read uh, everything on the website. Uh, so um, not every GANIC member was asked to submit a video. Uh, so if you were not asked, don't feel excluded. It's not going to be promoting specific tours. It's really just kind of introducing the, uh, the program. Uh, so it's not like you're missing any opportunities. If you upload your tours, you will have the same exposure as any other guide uh, will have. So thank you. Yes. So, um, yeah. So thank you, Michael. And this is, this is, you know, a, a, another great, great idea. And hopefully we'll be getting out there and we will be touring the city. I know I can't, I can't wait as <laughs> yes, all of us are yeah, getting a little, a little screened out, a little COVID out here. So, um, yeah, so I really think that's it. Um, I don't know if, um, any of our, um, if any of the other board members have anything to contribute, who have anything that they'd like to like to add, um, you know, just just unmute yourself and um, feel free to talk. Let um, me just look in the chat. Any last? Um, is there any last questions or any last comments? Um, otherwise, I think we're pretty much done here. Okay, so let me unmute. Um, all my panelists. Okay. All right. So comments from the board. Everyone's good. Stay safe. Stay healthy. If you, would like to support, if you would like to make a statement of support for the proposed legislation, please email it to the board at gannick.org. Board mm -hmm. at gannick.org. Mm -hmm. Okay. And everyone else. All right. So thank you guys. Thank you for another um, great meeting. This has been recorded and um jeremy is making a motion to adjourn second the motion <laughs> second the motion all right all right thank you guys thank you Gannick, once again i love connecting with everybody virtually our little brady bunch right here um the board you know we'll probably have another meeting in 10 minutes i guess so <laughs> all right be well everybody Please wash your hands time. have a great night thank you guys so much okay bye everybody. thank you everybody bye everyone bye, bye.